Um, so I would just like to perhaps uh, continue from uh, Anne's introduction to say that actually uh, this talk here in Montpellier marks a really wonderful uh, story of uh, scientific interaction that spans actually 20 years. It's a European experience uh, because I actually came uh, over to Montpellier for the first time uh, 20 years ago as an Erasmus student and I worked with Nicolas Bierne in ISEM at the time. And over and uh, that's when I was given a book of uh, Jacques Blondel on evolutionary ecology to read, and this is when the adventure started. And I had the, the great um, privilege to uh, collaborate and befriend many um, CNRS from Montpellier researchers uh, over time. So now I'm going to share my screen and present you the talk that, okay. All right. So, uh, today I will be, oh, and I'll just start my timer as well. So today I'll be talking about life on our doorstep. And as most of us live in urban areas, life on our doorstep is really about urban ecology and evolution. So there has been uh, much focus over the decades to really um, study ecology and evolution in a natural setting and to study evolutionary dynamics in a natural setting specifically because this is where the um, environment fluctuates and this is where we can best understand uh, patterns of selection and response to selection over time. And it is true that uh, Charles Darwin, when he uh, himself um, um, formulated uh, a synthesis, uh, an understanding of, of evolution, he was actually uh, traveling around the world uh, and observing natural phenomena in natural habitats to grasp this idea of uh, how we came to be. However, what is also interesting is that humans like ants are ecosystem engineers. And what's fascinating in this comparison is that ants uh, evolved around 140 million years ago. And within that time frame, there's around 10,000 species of other insects that evolved to take advantage of the resources that ants created as ecosystem engineers. While we, in contrast, uh, have been building cities only for the past 200 years. So since our original times uh, as hunter-gatherers, we have transformed uh, the environment with increasing speed. Uh, and uh, we have transformed the ecosystem that we live in from savannas to agricultural lands to cities finally, where we have actually um, gathered an increasing amount of energy into the ecosystem. And so we are thereby um, getting to the um, flagship construct of our times, and these are cities. So urbanization is a growing phenomenon. There is more and more people living in cities. Uh, at the moment, we have probably crossed the threshold of more than half of the world's humanity living in urban areas. And if we can, and it's not a, a phenomenon that is only specific to one continent, cities are growing worldwide. Um, and so you can see here that essentially circles are scaled in proportion to urban population size. And what you can see is that more and more people worldwide live in cities. And consequently, uh, the, the space that is occupied by cities is increasing worldwide as well. And it is estimated that around 3% of the land area is currently uh, occupied by cities. So uh, as it has been phrased by Hutchinson in uh, 65, um, ecology, we, we can talk about the ecological theater and the evolutionary play. And Marina Alberti recently has put that in a context of the urban environment, uh, that by changing the ecological theater, cities are simultaneously changing both the actors and the stage, uh, thereby uh, leading the way to a new eco-evolutionary play. So uh, cities are this construct element of the Anthropocene we are living currently. And by just continuing this narrative of, of, a, of a theatrical play, I would like to you to present you some data about uh, the Anthropocene and, uh, and the urban environment and how by talking about nest boxes, cities and parallel cities, we can gain a greater understanding on the evolutionary uh, dynamics that are occurring in the Anthropocene. So uh, first of all, I uh, will start by uh, discussing um, the natural world. So as I was saying, a lot of um, 
knowledge about the natural world that we have gathered is in seemingly natural habitats such as this picture of Wartham Woods in Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom. And uh, we would imagine that by looking at um, nest boxes, at, at birds in nest boxes, we are capturing some element of the natural environment. However, to what extent, what, what does it mean natural? Uh, are we actually um, really capturing uh, natural variation um, in these forests? Uh, so we have to remember that a lot of vertebrates, that most of our natural um, wildlife essentially originally evolved in natural uh, primeval habitats, but we hardly have any uh, primeval habitats left in the environment and essentially all what we're capturing currently in the so-called natural habitat stems from uh, secondary forests and uh, a lot of information, fantastic information that we have gathered uh, in evolutionary ecology stems from these nest boxes. So uh, I don't think I need to uh, tell much about the amazing data that has been collected uh, across Europe and that we have collected from our uh, nest box study sites and nest boxes are incredibly useful because they're easy to follow breeds, a bird's breed uh, re readily in them and it is easy to collect large sample sizes which are often essential to really have a grasp on the ecological and evolutionary parameters that are essential to understand how organisms um, respond to a changing environment and how they adapt to their natural environment. And so this is these pictures are like a typical of what you would see from a from a evolutionary ecology study um, of uh, uh, of uh, birds. Um, but here I'd like to present you the work of Joanna Sudika and Irene Dilecha that uh, have uh, gone beyond that uh, and they have asked well, what is happening really uh, in uh, natural cavities? I mean, does what we can observe in nest boxes actually reflect natural trade variation of birds that originally are breeding in natural cavities? And if we are to look into um, field work collected, if we're to look into field work uh, by looking at natural cavities of a model study system, such as the graded or the bluted, field work suddenly becomes uh, quite much of a bigger task because instead of just, for example, checking all the nest boxes in a certain sequence, you actually have to start early in the season and identify the natural cavities and you need to uh, get uh, to them. And finally, to collect phenotypic or life history traits, you need to extract data that is often quite challenging to get. So you can see here, Joanna Sudeka that is trying to extract some nestlings from the natural cavity to be able to weigh it, to collect blood samples. Uh, or to ring at them. So uh, what I'd like to show you here is that essentially we took an, uh, an experimental approach to try and understand whether natural variation in nest boxes is equivalent to that in natural, habit in, uh, natural cavities. And so this is uh, the result of work carried out in 2018 and 2019, where essentially we set up, uh, we're essentially in a, in a true urban forest in an urban protected forest that has remnants of primeval habitat so with a complex phytosociological structure with a lot of old trees essentially we have been following uh, breeding events both in natural cavities and we have also erected an experimental nest box site uh, just across the road where the environment doesn't vary and the only thing that differs in the environment is the presence of um, is the presence of nest boxes and what you can see is that the density of um, the density of breeding vents of both blutus and greatest is actually highly equivalent when we look at the natural cavity site which is just here and when we compare it to the nest box cavity site um, on the other side of the road um, moreover uh, if we look at 2019, similarly, the trend is quite similar. So densities don't really differ between natural cavity and um, nest box sites. Uh, what is interesting is that if we look at the microclimate of nest boxes, we actually see that natural cavities um, have a much more stable environment in terms of temperature and also in terms of humidity, which is the data that I'm not showing. 
Well, in terms of the nest box, actually the temperature profile of a nest box follows very closely to the temperature profile over 24 hours of the ambient temperature. And if we look at these effects of uh, natural cavities, nest boxes versus natural cavities in terms of life history or fitness, there are actually differences in, in the reproductive cycle. And so, for example, blue tits in nest boxes lay considerably earlier relative to blue tits in natural cavities. They lay uh, larger clutches uh, and they take longer until fledging. Great tits, on the other hand, um, uh, have a shorter onset of incubation and also leave the nest later. So what we have found in our two year study uh, is that actually there are some year and species effects. But if we compare this data to uh, data collected by Catherine Purcell in 97, like in a study published in 97, where she compared the breeding ecology of birds nesting in boxes and tree cavities, we also see that uh, essentially there are some parameters that she found that are uh, significantly different uh, when these two types of cavities uh, are compared. And what you can see here is that essentially the profile of breeding of blutus and gratus in Europe fits very strongly uh, the, um, the, the patterns that Purcell observed in species in, the, in North America. So, in some ways, uh, what, what is possibly concerning here is that lay date and clutch size are key life history traits that are also uh, used in our understanding of evolutionary dynamics in the natural environment. And so to what extent what we are really measuring in nest boxes represents what the large bulk of the population is actually going through because nest boxes are not present across the entire natural habitat. These are model systems. So summing up this um, part of the talk, uh, I would like to say that what we found is that there are similar densities of birds in nest boxes and in natural habitats. And in some ways, this is really good news because this could also be perceived as a as, a, as experimental evidence of the fact that uh, when presented with the possibility, birds prefer to breed in nest boxes because the densities in both natural cavities and nest boxes was highly similar. Um, there are definitely different temperature and humidity profiles of nest boxes relative to natural cavities. And most importantly, there is definitely a different pattern of life history dynamics in these nest boxes relative to natural cavities. And so the question that I'd like to leave you with is whether estimates of selection and response to selection derived from nest box studies are truly reflective of natural variation occurring in natural cavities where most birds are still breeding. So I don't think it's necessarily a problem if we are talking about, for example, a certain correction factor. So imagining that essentially all birds in nest boxes breed by a constant number of breeding days earlier than those in natural cavities. But the question is to what extent we can really say that, uh, for example, what we have been um, investigating in longitudinal studies really reflects of what is happening in natural cavities. Perhaps uh, there is a stronger buffering occurring in natural cavities. Uh, I think this is, this is a, a highly uh, controversial uh, topic and it doesn't make our data interpretation easier, but I will leave you with this um, because this is certainly something that we have to keep in mind when we are uh, trying to derive uh, uh, specific estimates of fitness uh, um, in, in, uh, in the wild from, natural, from nest boxes. So uh, I would like to now move on to the next part of uh, my, my, my talk, and that is specifically to, um, to discuss the city. So uh, five years ago, I started a project where the idea was to study greatest and bluetits in a gradient of urbanization in Warsaw, and to try and study concomitantly the effects of phenotype, genotype, and fitness in a radically altered environment that is uh, linked to urbanization. And uh, to give you a little bit of context um, regarding um, how the study started, well, this is Margaret Hamilton, and uh, you can see here uh, her code that allowed her to send people off to the moon. Uh, and this is uh, essentially the, the admin that was necessary to establish a study site in an urban environment. And that stems from the fact that there is a lot of 
uh, sociocultural particularities, depending on the city where you are working, that makes uh, fuel work in an urban environment more or less difficult in Warsaw because of changes in property laws related to nationalization and then uh, restitution of property. It was actually very difficult to get permits for the different study sites that I'll be talking about, but we made it work. So um, yes, that's definitely not uh, not uh, as big a feat as sending people to the moon, but I was still very happy nevertheless that it succeeded. So uh, what are we left with or what are we starting with? Uh, well, here you can see the city of Warsaw um, and the city center. Uh, Warsaw is a, is a capital city of Poland with around 2 million people living in the city. And you can see here that essentially we have established uh, nine study sites uh, across an, a gradient of urbanization uh, in Poland. And you can see that actually these sites are here set in those kind of diets. And this is not a coincidence. That's because I tried to essentially identify sites that are close to each other, but that are highly contrasted in terms of the vegetation properties uh, of sites, because that will further on uh, allow for some more experimental work uh, once we have characterized the system. So um, how do we define the urban space? Uh, when uh, you actually look at the studies that have been reviewed thoroughly by Mark Johnson and Jason Munchi South in their seminal paper from 2017, Evolution of Life in Urban Environment, you actually notice that three quarters of the studies of urbaniza urbanization impact on the biology of wildlife uh, use qualitative term to define the environment. So essentially, mostly what you find in publications is urban and rural. And uh, only a quarter actually tries to take a quantitative approach to urbanization. And when you look into these uh, quantitative uh, studies of the urban environment, um, many people would characterize it either with land cover classes, or they would use the percentage of built up area or impervious surface. And it is true that there are many, many ways you can define the urban environment. And that depending on the biological question that you're asking, some variables may be more relevant than others. And um, the thing is that you can quantify the urban environment using remotely sensed variables, or you can actually be in the ground and collect data that is specifically relevant um, because, and that you can only collect uh, being on the ground. So uh, here is just a list. Uh, and that these different uh, axes of environmental variation are likely to sometimes impact different aspects of the biology of the species you're looking at, but it can include impervious surface area, so concrete and asphalt, um, and DVI, so the photosynthetic activity of the environment. You can look at tree cover, light pollution, air pollution, distance to roads, sound pollution or human presence. I would like to focus largely on this index of impervious surface area. So essentially the amount of concrete and asphalt that is in the environment, because it is a highly repeatable measure that you can also easily compare across studies. And it essentially tells you whether there is biological life that is covered or, sorry, it essentially tells you uh, how much of the environment um, uh, does not have any biological activity because it is essentially covered in concrete or uh, asphalt. So uh, what uh, um, uh, my PhD student Nicola Corsini has done uh, here is a visualization of the amount of impervious surface in the 516 nest boxes that have been erected in the gradient of urbanization in Warsaw. And you can see that these are our nine uh, study sites or actually eight represented here because one natural forest I think isn't presented. And what it shows you is that essentially the urban environment is not like a smooth line of imperviousness from once from the city center to uh, the natural uh, air, from a natural space. What you see is that the urban environment is a mosaic of heterogeneous environments that have more or less impervious surfaces around you. Intuitively, of course, you know that you have urban parks and you have uh, office areas in every city around the world. But the problem is that a lot of studies uh, that um, sometimes present urban data actually focuses on, on very distinct uh, parts of the city, such as the urban park. And that's not necessarily reflective of the biological processes that are really occurring across the full gradient. So what you can see here is that from the most out more out, out 
uh, from the furthest from the city to the very city center, you can see that the different study sites have a different amount of impervious surface. Each data point is a nest box, and you can see the amount of impervious surface around every nest box that has been quantified in a radius of 100 meters. So I will walk you through some of these sites just so that you have an idea of how variable the, the environment is in a gradient of urbanization. So we are starting with the most outward study site. It's a suburban village and the natural forest. And so you can see that there is a lot of green in the natural forest. The amount of impervious surface is virtually zero because it is essentially a large uh, protected forest just on the outskirts, 20 kilometers outside of Warsaw. And then if you go into the city, you can see that you have an intermix of different types of habitats. This is a residential area. While just at, at this, on the south of this residential area, you will see a little urban woodland. You also have uh, much larger swaths of green uh, areas. And one such example is, for example, the Jewish Cemetery, which is uh, very much in the city center of Warsaw. Or we have the office area, which corresponds to the university campus. Uh, and you also have um, another res residential area that ha we have been monitoring. So, uh, sorry, maybe I haven't mentioned this, but every little black dot is a nest box that we have been following uh, over the past years. And finally, uh, we also have an urban park. So the typical urban site that uh, people would normally uh, do um, research in, in urban ecology. Now, as I said, um, impervious surface area is overall highly stable, uh, highly repeatable in time, unless you are experiencing very intense urbanization. But there are also other important variables uh, of the urban space that are much more labile. And the question is, well, to what extent these are actually repeatable? To what extent do they, are they possible to exert repeatable uh, impact on biological organisms? So in other words, some axes of the urban environment need to be uh, repeatable in order to produce an impact on, on the wildlife. And so we have also demonstrated that, for example, human presence, even though it differs in space, it is a highly, uh, it is, a, sorry, not highly, it is a repeatable uh, variable uh, with a repeatability of around 0.6. If you include enough counts of humans in, on the site to essentially capture in a variation of, um, of human presence in the environment. Uh, some variables are actually very poorly repeatable and that is why it's important to be aware of this repeatability problem depending on the, the type of question that you are asking. And so just to give you an example, uh, we have also been looking at the uh, air pollution and the concentration of particulate matter in the environment. And you can see that depending on the measurement day, you will either have high pollution uh, of particulate matter or low uh, values of pollution. And similarly, air pollution can be highly variable in space. What you can see here is that you actually have some peaks of pollution that are likely to correspond to um, uh, being uh, household waste being burned by specific households and that corresponds to this peak in uh, particulate matter. So uh, this has also been mirrored by some other researchers that have found that, for example, uh, um, uh, NOx pollution in an urbanization gradient is also poorly repeatable. And the time frame through which you measure different types of pollution in the air matters a lot for your uh, inference. Now, uh, if you actually plot the different environmental variables um, in, a, in, a, in a principal component analysis, you will see that these uh, variables do co-vary with each other. And again, I'd like to focus on this impervious um, variable that is highly correlated with human presence, light pollution and temperature, and even more so when we are looking at intra-city uh, uh, patterns. So, uh, I have characterized the city and the question is, well, what are the biological effect of the city uh, that we can detect? So first of all, again, uh, this is work from uh, of, uh, Michela Carcini that has uh, looked at growth curves and at the growth of uh, passerine birds uh, in the city. Uh, and what you can see here is that if we characterize nest boxes as being surrounded by either high ISA, so high impervious surface area in the vicinity, or low ISA, 
Uh, well, there is a, a weak indication that and that uh, birds grow uh, in a different trajectory in the uh, low ice environment. So if there is more green uh, vegetation in the environment relative to those that grow in the high ice environment. However, uh, these trends are actually not significant from each other. Now, what's important to remember here is that in this particular data set, we only have birds that have survived throughout the entire growth trajectory. And that data set is completely different to a full data set of breeding events that we observe in the urban environment, uh, because a lot of birds are essentially dying uh, over time. And so if we look at that uh, more closely, uh, you will see that actually the effect of ISA, so impervious surface on check mass over time. Um, so when birds hatch, uh, there is no effect of ISA on the mass of chicks uh, two days after hatching. But you can see that the further you grow, there is actually a highly significant negative effect of ISA on five days after hatching and 10 days after hatching. Uh, and similarly for blue tits, you uh, see a similar pattern where essentially um, originally there is no effect of ISA on the mass of birds uh, shortly after hatching, but then there is a very negative effect over time. Uh, and similarly for survival, um, essentially you, uh, what we found is that there is a significant effect of impervious surface area in the close vicinity of nest boxes especially at the level of medium and late survival stages. And it is possible that essentially we don't see the effect, any effect of ISA at the life history stage, uh, at the late survival, just because most of the mortality has occurred in these intermediate life history stages. Uh, now, another uh, interesting analysis is related to uh, the, the analysis of standardized selection differentials. So essentially what we can see here is that uh, generally there is um, significant selection on the trait that we used. So that is mass after hatching, today's after hatching. And so it is true that there is a selection on mass uh, for both species and whatever the environment we are looking at. However, what is particularly important here is that we can also see that selection on mass is significantly more, uh, significantly uh, stronger uh, in a high ISA environment. So in other words, uh, if you hatch as a heavy bird, it matters much more for your fitness if you happen to hatch in a high ISA environment. So this trend is significant for gray tits and it is not significant for blue tits, but you can also see that the point estimate of uh, selection is, uh, is uh, considerably higher in a high ISA environment. So uh, what uh, can we say? So here there is uh, a little bit of a preliminary uh, data. Essentially this year we have managed to finalize a five year long data set of, of, of breeding data on the Warsaw gradient. And what you can see here is really, this is raw data, but what it shows you, you don't need any stats to really see uh, with the naked eye that the impervious surface uh, effect on, uh, survive, on the number of fledglings, on the number of individuals that are in the nest shortly before fledging out of the nest box, uh, that there is a significant negative effect on the number of, of ISA, on the number of fledglings for both species, no matter which year you're looking at. And uh, as I said, this is very much data in preparation, but if you just want to have a little bit of a bullpack figure and see, well, what is the impact of 50% ISA in your environment? How does that affect I uh, num fitness? Well, uh, we can really see that essentially fitness here exemplified as the number of fledglings, that fitness is halved in both species with a 50% increase of ISA in the environment. So by concluding here uh, about this, this part of the talk, you can see that we have found that impervious surface and the vicinity of your breeding event significantly has a significant pervasive negative effect on mass and fitness and that a bullpack figure that we will need to refine in, in statistical models is that a 1% increase of imperviousness results in a 1% decrease in fitness loss. So um, 
of course, what one may ask, well, okay, but what is, why is ISA so detrimental to the fitness of birds? And uh, as I was saying, ISA essentially exemplifies habitat loss, where essentially if you have concrete or asphalt, you do not have any, uh, any natural life on that uh, surface area. And one of the biological drivers of, um, of this decrease in fitness that should be uh, investigated further is food. And this is a, um, a, a, a still of um, video analysis made by Michela Corsini uh, that essentially shows what kind of food the birds bring to the nest in a gradient of urbanization. And if you were in a natural forest, uh, you would essentially uh, largely um, um, have caterpillars being brought to the nest and sometimes a little bit of spiders. But if you're in the city, you suddenly see that there is just this wide area of other types of food that are brought to the nest on a much more regular basis. And so uh, if you think about food, you would, you, so if you're thinking about how animals acclimate to uh, the urban environment or adapt at a genetic level, but let's stay for the moment at this kind of phenotypic level, uh, acclimation can be um, mediated also by essentially uh, how you assimilate food in a radically novel environment. And one possible role into how animals cope is the role of uh, the, uh, the gut microbiota inside uh, the gut of birds breeding, uh, whether in an urban or rural environment. And so just to give you um, a little bit of a uh, snapshot uh, data. Here there is a, some work that uh, we have been doing with uh, Anju Marachi and Barbara Kaspers at the University of Bielefeld. And uh, I would like to present some data on the gut microbiota in the context of this reduction in mass caused by impervious surface area. And so we have looked, sorry, at the changes in uh, gut microbiota uh, diversity in terms of alpha diversity, or better diversity. And what you can see is that there is essentially a lower species richness uh, in the urban environment relative to what can be found in the rural environment. And also that impervious surface area specifically drives a shift in community composition of the gut microbiota uh, in a gradient of urbanization. So the color coding perhaps is not ideal, but what you can see here is that essentially the further you go along this axis, the more you have uh, highly urbanized sites, such, sorry, such as, um, sorry, I just don't see my legend. Um, so, yes, so the more you go, uh, you have highly urbanized sites, such as the office area and residential areas in gray, so they are high ISA sites. Uh, and uh, the less impervious surface you have, the more uh, the microbiota samples uh, cluster um, on this side of the graph. So uh, by summarizing this part of the talk, essentially, I think, I hope to have shown you that urbanization um, is essentially concomitant with environmental and biological stimuli that are outside of the natural ranges. And a bullpack figure of 1% imperviousness resulting in a 1% decrease in fitness loss uh, will still need to be uh, confirmed, but it is a bullpack figure that I would like to hold on to. Uh, and also we have found that there is stronger selection on mass attaching in high ISA environments. And that um, essentially urbanization alters not only fitness and phenotype and fitness, but also internal gut microbiota. So all in all, there is a pervasive and negative impact of ISA on uh, vertebrate pathway biology. Okay, so everything that I have shown you so far stems uh, from data that has been collected in one city. And we know, as, as I have mentioned already in the introduction, that cities are everywhere. Uh, and the very exciting experimental um, framework that one might ask is what is the potential of cities as, uh, as a, um, essentially a, um, a, a globally replicated experiment of parallel evolution worldwide. And uh, this is something that we uh, wanted to address as well. And so, as I just mentioned, so far you have only seen data from Warsaw, but what if we have a glimpse of patterns that are occurring not only in one city, 
but in more uh, cities uh, across uh, the country. And so essentially, uh, we have um, performed uh, an analysis of uh, phenotype uh, and genotype patterns across multiple cities, across eight cities, where we have essentially caught uh, birds uh, that are just, be just before the breeding season, so in uh, February and March, across eight cities. And this is work, uh, this is tremendous work uh, made by Arno da Silva, Marta Cele, Justyna Schulz, and Łukasz Wardecki. So essentially they have captured by MESNET territorial birds just before the breeding season in 2017 and 18. And again, we tried to really emphasize the need that not only do we want to look at these different cities, but also uh, the misnetting occurred in five habitats in every city. So birds have been misnetted in natural forests, so these four large swaths of uh, natural forest, suburban forests, natural corridors, urban parks, residential areas, and urban centers. And in total, uh, 650 blue tits and gray tits were captured throughout this uh, initiative that lasted uh, two years, just before the breeding season. And uh, to answer the question about whether we see actually replicated processes. So uh, this is the work of uh, Marion Chatelain, who has, uh, done, uh, who has done a lot of work on the um, dynamic of trace metal elements or heavy metals in biological tissues uh, in, in a gradient of urbanization and in these replicated cities. And what you can see here is that essentially the uh, PCA axis that captures uh, the, the bulk of uh, heavy metal variation in the feathers, you can see that essentially the, the closer you are to the city center, the greater the concentration of a trace metal, heavy metal concentration in feathers. And what you have to remember here is that these, uh, these values are essentially averaged over eight cities. So there is a very clear trend that uh, it, no matter what city you're in, there is a replicated trend for an increase in uh, heavy metal pollution inside the feathers uh, of the birds um, uh, in, 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 in these replicated cities, no matter for and in both species. So another uh, analysis that uh, we went on to perform is to look at uh, the genotypic properties of birds uh, in these replicated uh, urban system. And so we have looked at the affymetrics. So we essentially, we genotyped great tits using the affymetrics SNP chip uh, and uh, to generate a high uh, genotypic uh, data set that can could then be tested in the context of these different environmental variables. And so uh, a first result that I would like to show is about the nucleotide diversity across sites. And what you can see is that essentially uh, nucleotide diversity was pretty much equivalent across the eight cities, the suburban forests and the natural forests. Um, however, if we actually then plug this allelic matrix into an RDA analysis, and we look at the first two axes of, of the RDA, we can see that uh, the, the data points actually cluster very nicely based on city coordinates, so city latitude and longitude. So if you see, these are essentially the different cities that are included in the data set, and the green dots are essentially reflective of the large forest reserves that were, um, that were also included in the analysis. So in other words, we know that there is genetic structuring um, in space. That in itself is not particularly novel. Uh, however, what was uh, very nice to observe is that uh, there is also a very uh, convincing trend of urbanization here characterized by ISA at the sampling site, so at the, at the place, so we derived essentially the amount, an amount of impervious surface in the vicinity of the uh, misnetting site in the different environments. And you can see that there is a highly significant uh, drive for uh, an effect of ISA on genotypic variants when the entire data set is uh, taken into account. So um, this is great, but then the question is, well, okay, maybe this trend is actually driven by one or two cities. And in other words, what we really want to know is whether there is a, a pattern for a, a change in genotypic frequencies driven by ISA in each of these particular cities. And so this is what I'm going to show you here. 
Uh, so not only were we curious to know, uh, and yes, so I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, um, but this work has been done by Sylvia Czarnomska, who did a postdoc in the lab. And so uh, what we wanted to see is, is there an effect of ISA at the level of the city on the genotypic matrix? And also we need to remember that there is also this question of scale. You, if you imagine that we set up a mistnet in a given habitat in a given city, uh, how do we calculate what is the right scale for inference of the amount of ISA next to the sampling site? And so this is what we did here, is that what I'm showing you here is that not only um, did we vary the, did we, are we here having results of uh, a redundancy analysis uh, on, of the effect of ISA on the genote, on the allelic matrix, in the different cities, but also when we take filter size of ISA that is of growing size around the sampling site. So um, what you can see here is that essentially there was a, a significant effect of, and highly significant in many instances, effect of ISA on genotypic variants in up to four cities out of the eight. There was an eighth city that I'm not representing here because we had a a coordinate problem, so we need to rerun analysis for one of the cities. But what is quite striking is out of uh, seven cities presented here, uh, and at a very small spatial scale and with a few numbers of, in, of relatively few, small number of individuals, we see a, an impact of ISA on the allelic matrix for four cities. And you can also see that the amount that depending on what spatial scale you're looking at, the signal of the effect of ISA on the uh, genotypic variants will vary a little bit. So this is something that we need to explore further, but uh, it essentially highlights again the fact that we really need to take into account a spatial scale when performing these analysis of urbanization on either biological or genotypic traits. So Summarizing uh, the, the talk a little bit, um, I hope to have, to have convinced you that essentially we have uh, convincingly shown that there is a radical change in the environment uh, driven by mm, the Anthropocene and driven by urbanization, whether we look at the level of nest boxes, gradient of urbanization or replicated cities. Uh, we have also detected a significant impact of urbanization on the phenotype uh, assessed as morphology, life history traits, or even trace metal and feathers. And uh, we have also found an effect of urbanization at the genotypic level uh, by looking at um, a SNP chip assay. And finally, there is also pervasive evidence that urbanization has an impact on individual survival with increasing amount of urbanization um, at the place where uh, these birds are developing. So yes, and another thing as well that I haven't shown uh, about the, so not only are we having these effects of urbanization on phenotype and genotype, but we can either dwell further and look at the extended phenotypes such as nests, and we know that there are differences in nest construction, and there is also um, an impact on the extended genotype that is uh, presented by a microbiota uh, community assemblage in the avian gut. So if we look at this very nice uh, graph that has been prepared by uh, Charles Perrier et al about the genomics of adaptation in the urban environment, uh, it essentially summarizes what we would need to know to convincingly say that there is genetic adaptation in the urban environment. And so based on the data that we have collected in the past years, we can see that there are differences in um, phenotype. Uh, there are also differences in patterns of selection in the city. And there are also differences at the level of the DNA and um, also differences at uh, this level of the extended genome that is brought by uh, microbes and microbiota in the gut. And what I think we should now move on to in the system is to essentially take more experimental approaches to look at candidate genes and to look at this microbiota in a little bit more detail. So these would be the, the, the further uh, element, lines of inquiry that I think are worth pursuing uh, in, the, in the future. So this is it for me. Uh, I think that uh, I would like to finish by saying that 
um, when we're talking about adaptation to urban environment, um, there is also a liability our liability as urban dwellers to uh, dis to act to play a role into how we view cities in the future, because there will be always a limit of adaptation, uh, no matter at what level we are uh, investigating it. So it is up to us really to decide whether we would like our cities to look like this, or whether we will just basically let it go and uh, end up in uh, cities that look a little bit more like uh, from a Blade Runner movie. So with that in mind, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if uh, the topic has um, caught your attention, uh, a lot more is essentially discussed by some wonderful contributors in a book that has been recently out, that has been recently published, uh, that I have edited together with uh, Jason Lunchy South and Anne Charmontier. And um, that will be it from me. Uh, one final very important slide i'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of people that have made this work possible uh, there has been a lot of very hard work from all the members of the wild urban evolution and ecology lab that have collected data in the field and um, and also analyzed it in the lab and um, in front of their computers over the past years so i'd like to very warmly uh, thank all these people that have uh, generated data uh, and all the Springfield assistants that have worked very hard in the field, and also a lot of uh, collaborators in Poland uh, and uh, in France and in Germany that have um, essentially made this work uh, even better. And, and, and yes, so I would like to thank all of these people because uh, these results would not have been possible to, to, to generate without uh, some great synergies between the different people uh, listed on these slides. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Martha, for this great talk. Um, so we have some questions on the Q&R. So one of them, or uh, two of them are by Gila. So uh, Gila Ganem can um, turn on her microphone. Yes. Presumably. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, was can you hear me? Yes. Go okay. Ahead. Okay. Uh, very, very nice talk and work. Um, Thank you. I wondered, um, you know, the first part, the first act of your presentation, uh, when you compared natural nest cavities and uh, and nest boxes. I wondered if the, the animals that would colonize uh, nest boxes are those that are less successful in colonizing natural ones. And then it would mean that uh, the differences in life history would be related to that, maybe. Mm -hmm. um... Uh, I think it is um, largely uh, unlikely in the sense that there is natural cavities in this site or were in excess. And so essentially in the site where we followed nest boxes, there was also a lot of natural cavities. So essentially they could have gone into the natural cavities. And this is a little bit of what happened in 2019 when great, uh, great density in nest boxes was actually a little bit lower and um, a lot, uh, quite a, quite a portion of greatest were then found in natural cavities in the nest box site. So that's data that I haven't shown, but uh, it is unlikely that uh, it is a question of being less successful, I think. Uh, I, I'm not sure you, you got me completely, but uh, I mean, uh, I would expect uh, the birds to be in natural cavity and in the nest box in, in the same place. But my question was whether there would be different individuals that would go for the nest boxes, because maybe it's more difficult, as you said, to, mm -hmm. to colonize them. Yeah, so I... Um, like okay. personalities, different personalities, or... Yeah, um, well, again, I would go, it's not impossible, but I would go back to the fact that the densities were highly equivalent between nest box and natural cavity sites, mm -hmm. so I, um, yes, I mean, personality wise, these birds haven't been tested. So that's a fair point. Uh, I think that this is a limit of the setup that we had. Um, yeah, I guess this is something that uh, could be looked uh, further into. Okay, thanks. Shall I ask my second question, Luis, or wait for the others? Uh, 
Yes, yeah, you, you can go ahead, I think. Okay, my question about the microbiota, uh, I don't know anything about it, but I was surprised to see that the diversity of food uh, that, you, that the animals have in, in town is higher, but the diversity of microbiota yeah. is lower. So I, I wondered if it is something that is expected generally, yeah. or it's a surprise. So that's a very good comment. Essentially, actually, reports in the literature are mixed about uh, alpha diversity. So this uh, um, essentially microbiota richness in the city. Some studies really do report that there is actually higher alpha diversity in cities. Um, and it's important. So yes, so essentially, um, this is very preliminary data. and. Uh, it definitely needs to be investigated further because there is also not, not just the question of species richness, but also the type of uh, ecosystem properties of these uh, different types of bacteria. So that's essentially a first part of an investigation that, uh, that needs to be looked into with more detail. Okay, thank you. Junk food in the cities, there's a comment. Uh, okay, um, so Mathieu Joron, who likes uh, predation, a lot has a question about predation. Uh, someone can turn on his microphone. Uh, hi, Marta. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, we often hear that, um, you know, living close to humans uh, makes the habitat um, devoid of predators. Maybe that doesn't really match uh, the case of a uh, nesting uh, birds because of cats. But I was wondering if there was any correlation between a predation gradient and the ISA gradient, or is there a, you know, yeah. how, does, how does predation vary with a, you know, center to um, distance to city center or with ISA? So essentially what we're really lacking is a longitudinal um, uh, follow-up of uh, bird movement after they leave the nest. And that's something that would uh, answer a lot of questions that for, for the moment are unanswered. But uh, the thing is, is that a lot of the predation that is occurring in natural environments often occurs, uh, well, we, we at least know that a lot is occurring during uh, tit development in the nest box, such as woodpeckers. Uh, there is definitely fewer of them in the city, so overall predation rates are higher in the natural environment um, uh, during uh, chick development. Uh, but we don't really know what is happening later on. So I do agree that uh, definitely there are more cats in the city. And I would, uh, wouldn't be surprised if it is to some level correlated with the amount of impervious surface. The question is, is that it doesn't really necessarily uh, implies that there are fewer predators later on in the natural habitat. So that would just need exp more work uh, and we don't have any precise quantitative estimates about them. So it's, I think it's quite difficult to, to speculate on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's a question by Zun Mao. Um, do you want to turn on your microphone? <clears throat> Yes, no, uh, person left apparently. So I, I see the question, I'll just answer it straight away. Essentially the nest boxes and natural habitats were not really geographically separated. They were separated by 200 meters and both stands do not differ in uh, light pollution, uh, noise pollution, air pollution, uh, and also most importantly, perhaps geographical, uh, social, Phytosociological composition. So essentially, it's the same forest. Mm. Okay. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, I'm going to skip Yanis for now. Okay. I like doing that uh, because it seems like the Philippa Guillerme's um, question is related to the previous one, in my understanding. Uh, so uh, Filipa can turn on her microphone. She wants to have. Ah, yeah. Okay, cool. So how would you deal with areas with high ISA, but with high vegetation cover, green roofs or tree cover in paved areas? So um, essentially what, what I have shown in the uh, principal component analysis is that we have a very, very clear negative correlation between ISA and tree cover. So at least in Warsaw, green roofs are not yet in. Uh, but I think it would be a very nice uh, question, you know, when uh, green roofs, I mean, I, I'm, 
to be entirely honest, I just don't think that the green roofs will uh, gain uh, the kind of huge momentum that would be required to make a real impact onto this negative correlation between uh, tree cover and ISA. But, um, and actually even I think in those countries, including France, where uh, these uh, regulations are necessary, um, governments are caving in for, for example, also allowing sol solar panels and roofs, because it's just very, very difficult to have green roofs. Mm -hmm. So, um, but overall, um, yeah, so like as a bullback figure, there is definitely a strong negative correlation between both. So I think that these kind of situations where we would have high ISA and high tree cover, well, essentially, I guess it would be just a better environment than, uh, than, um, than in an environment where you have high ISA and low tree cover. But at the end of the day, this is something that you then uh, essentially deal with in a, in a model selection framework where you essentially can uh, either, uh, well, you basically decide on which variables you fit in a model. So I think this is something that just can be statistically addressed, specifically if you essentially uh, uh, clar like formulate your biological hypothesis and then you go from there. Okay, so Philippa seems to have left so she can see the answer on YouTube, I guess. So um, yes, Yanis uh, Michalakis had a question having to do with um, local adaptation. So perhaps we can turn on his microphone or he can turn it on, I don't know. Am I really allowed to ask it? Yes, you can. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. So thank you for the seminar. Um, I had two questions, but I, I guess you won't be able to answer them from the answers you gave to the other ones. Anyway, is there any indication that um, uh, these birds may adapt to the urban environments? Uh, for instance, um, do the ones that uh, live in uh, high ASA environments uh, do better than uh, birds from the woods or vice versa? That's the first question. And the second one is a bit related and actually related as far as I can tell to one of Gira's questions which is uh, whether there is an indication of uh, um, habitat nest choice. Uh, uh, that is, uh, is there an indication that birds that are born in high ISA uh, nests tend to uh, settle more, breed more often in high ISA nests than the contrary? Yeah, so these are all very good questions, uh, especially in, a, in an evolutionary perspective of uh, adaptation to urban environment. And I'm sorry to say that the data for that is at the moment is still very scant, just because birds as a study system are great for some questions, but less so if we're talking about recruitment and experiments in the city. So uh, your question essentially has been answered in simpler systems such as ants. We have, uh, so Sarah Diamond has done some great work where she essentially cross foster, where, where she essentially uh, reared uh, rural ants in the urban environment and urban ants in the rural environment. And essentially they, she showed that uh, birds are sorry <laughs> that ants are adapted to their uh, to their original uh, environment and that rural bird sorry rural ants reproduced more poorly in the urban environment and vice versa. So in other words, you demonstrated based on the kind of thermal uh, based on a thermal regulation uh, argument and a heat island argument that uh, these kind of things. Uh, can be observed in or in uh, in in some uh, organisms. In terms of birds, um, I don't have this kind of data, but definitely uh, one powerful approach is to essentially use cross fostering, and um, that uh, is something that I'd like to uh, implement in the near future. But I don't have any cross fostering data to 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 to, to discuss just yet. Thank you very much. Can can Louis allow me a third one? Uh, yeah, go ahead if you want. Yeah, so uh, after what you said in the beginning, should I remove the tit nest boxes I have in my garden? and my breeding crooked tits? Where would you like to move them? Uh, I just uh, take them away. Why? Uh, well, if, if I'm well, helping... Uh, um, uh, if I'm helping... Uh, if I'm growing... Uh, Teats that are maladapted to the natural environment, perhaps I should stop, I don't know. 
Well, if you're living in a city, my argument would be is that uh, essentially, this is actually something that uh, gave me comfort when I was setting up the nest boxes initially, I thought like, well, even if we won't be able to get any data out of it, at least there are nest boxes in the city. This is the, the cool thing about uh, from a conservation point of view is that, you know, essentially I started with discussing natural cavities, but the thing is, is that in the city, most uh, trees don't have any natural cavities. So if you do want to have wildlife in the city, you really need to provide nest boxes. And so this is an opportunity to essentially generate wildlife in the city. So no, I wouldn't remove your nest boxes from your garden or balcony. Well, I'm, I'm in the countryside actually. Thank you anyway. What's your ISA, Yanis? You need to measure this. Well, it must be very low. <laughs> Martha should come measure it. <laughs> Just um, I had a quick question uh, about uh, also relating to local adaptation. Did you um, um, look at what um, parts or, or the parts of the genome um, that uh, that were correlated with ISA in your RDA analysis? Did you find anything that Seems interesting in there, or you didn't really check? Yeah, so that's that's essentially data that is ongoing. So that's definitely on the cards, uh, and we are running some analysis right now. But uh, I, uh, we don't have any results of that. Of, so of course, the, the idea would be to look at essentially genomic outliers by performing different types of uh, analysis of genomic analysis, and to see whether there are some overlapping genomic outliers depending on the on the method but we haven't gone down that route just yet i mean we do have some first selection of of um genome areas of interest by one analysis but we just want to validate it with some others so i don't have any data for the moment to to share about that okay so ongoing okay and last question would be by uh, gautier de Vigny. so i'll just uh you can turn on your your microphone now i think um You mean? Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks for this uh, very nice talk, Marta. Uh, this my question is about uh, um, a bit similar uh, than the one uh, asked by uh, Mathieu Joron. He, he was talking about predators. What about pathogens? Could it be that pathogens, the diversity and abundance, could explain at least a, a good part of the observed differences between your different sites? Yes, so that's a, again, this is a very good question and we've only started looking into that. So uh, there is a, a researcher, Eva, Dr. Eva Mijajewska, who is actually looking currently at incidence of avian malaria uh, in the multi-city data set. So we'll be having some data shortly. We also know that uh, there were different incidents of ticks uh, in the city and particularly there were more ticks in natural cavities, uh, in, in birds breeding in natural cavities than birds breeding in nest boxes. So again, you could also claim that there may be some different patterns of disease transmission depending on whether you breed in a natural cavity or in a nest box, but the sample sizes um, unfortunately here are, are quite small. Um, yes, so that's that's essentially to some level work in progress. And uh, also uh, Irena Dilice will be looking at incidence of avian malaria uh, between natural cavities and, and uh, nest boxes as well. So again, this is work in progress. Cool, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, great. So uh, let's uh, just thank uh, Martha again. So just to uh, reiterate that she's here uh, all year and she speaks perfectly French for those who prefer speaking French. Um, and okay, so um, just to tell you that the next talk, uh, next week, the next talk of the year will be by Clara Torres uh, Barcelo, so also another person who was in Montpellier before and now um, has a position at INRA in PACA. So um, um, see you next week. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you.